All right, for this next section, we're talking about the respiratory system. And a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about, kind of like a lot of this class, is functional problems that occur in the respiratory tract. Unlike foundations, though, a lot of what we're gonna be looking at is specific disease processes. And these are the three that we're really gonna be dealing with for this class. So tuberculosis, lung cancer, and traumatic events that can affect the respiratory system. Uh, but like always, we're gonna start off with a general overview of the lungs, what they do, and what kind of problems we should start to anticipate for patients who have respiratory disorders. So first thing, like what do the lungs do, right? What are their three big jobs? So one, ventilation. You know, moving air in and out of the lungs. So just having that gas exchange. So it brings us to respiration. So that is the movement of oxygen in and out of the body, right? So first air moving, then gas actually exchanging and being inside the body. The third big thing they do is they're one of our main ways of doing temperature control for our whole body. So our primary temperature control organ system is our skin, our integumentary system. Our second one is our lungs. You're taking all that warm, kind of that, that hot met metabolic activity and exhaling it from in the body to outside the body. So that's another big one that we do need to keep in mind as we start looking at some of these disorders. Everybody remember the Krebs cycle? It's gonna be on the test. No, it's not gonna be on the test. But the Krebs cycle from back in high school biology, this is kind of the reason why we care so much about the respiratory system, why it's both the A and the B of the ABCs, is all those red dots are oxygen. Without oxygen, there is no ATP production at the cellular level, meaning there is no cellular energy available and cells will die if they don't have ATP formation. So like basically everything biology depends on oxygen. So super important stuff. So for our respiratory assessment, the way to start thinking about this, the way to start breaking it down, I know you guys are taught like look, listen, feel as the way you do assessment. Well, yes and no. In clinical practice, the key first step is ask. Ask, ask, ask all the things. So ask your patients, how are they breathing? Is that normal for them? Is it abnormal for them? We want to hear their experience of the difference between their current presentation and how they normally are. Then we want to look, we wanna look and see chest rise, right? We wanna see symmetrical chest rise, both sides. So that getting down to the foot of the bed and looking at their chest going up and down symmetrically is a big deal. And we're gonna talk about some specific disorders where that doesn't happen. Then we wanna listen. We wanna listen for normal breath sounds, meaning clear breath sounds throughout, and be able to differentiate some of our big abnormal ones. Things like crackles, which is that kind of rice crispy or cereal sound, especially in the bases of lungs. Ronchi, which is like phlegm down in the lungs, not just like in the throat. And wheezes is another big one, which indicates a narrowing or constriction of the airway, which causes that whistling kind of sound in, the air, in, the, in both the trachea and the upper and lower airway. Then we wanna feel. You can actually put your hands on a patient's thorax over their chest, over their back, and you can feel when they have ronca. You can feel the vibrations of those thick secretions moving as they do coughing, as they do deep breathing. So those are some of the things we want to do for our respiratory assessment. But ask, ask, ask. Always start your assessment with asking patients about their current experience versus what's different right now. So really narrowing in on the change that's taken place that's caused them to seek care for their medical illness. Then we wanna get data. We want our objective data. So vital signs, we want our oxygen saturation. Here in Colorado, we're at high elevation. 90% is about where we start to go from 
feeling good about the world to getting a little bit concerned about our patients. So in the 80s, that's not really a number that we accept here in Colorado. But the 90s, that's an area that we can live with. Then we wanna look at our labs. So if we're doing ABGs on our patients, so arterial blood gases, we can directly measure the amount of oxygen in their bloodstream. Most patients are not getting arterial blood gases done. These are arterial sticks. They're, they're pretty invasive for patients. But a lot of patients are going to be getting uh, blood work done, and especially CBCs, especially for infection monitoring and bl normal blood counts. So we're looking at their hemoglobin and hematocrit being the oxygen carrying components of their red blood cells. So those are the two that we really do kind of emphasize when we're talking about respiratory capacity and oxygen carrying capacity. Then some of the other things that may be done by or ordered by physicians to really assess the respiratory system, things like a chest x-ray, which is gonna show us uh, the density in their chest, so we can see things like inflammation or tissue density with a pneumonia, things like that. Or a CT scan, which is a more detailed picture where we can see things like blood clots and other such physiologic abnormalities that can affect the respiratory system. And finally, we can do respiratory culture, where patients can either like do that hacking, kind of phlegmy, production of mucus, and we can culture that and see if there's bacterial growth in their respiratory tract. Key thing, one of the big interventions we do for most respiratory disorders that cause hypoxia is we give oxygen. These are listed by an order of like least invasive to most invasive. So first intervention is our leader flow oxygen via nasal cannula. So you always put those on from the nose, over the ears, under the chin. Never put those on from the nose, over the ears, to the back of the head, because that resembles a noose. And we never want to put a noose around our patient's head, because they will migrate it to their neck, and that is a very uncomfortable position we do not want to be in as nurses. So nasal cannulas are great for oxygen delivery at low levels with low FiO2, or low percent oxygen saturation delivery. So we can do nasal cannulas at one to six liters of oxygen flow. Any more than that, anything above six liters, and we're really just adding more noise, but the device itself won't deliver any more oxygen. So any patient who's requiring liter flow above six liters from a standard nasal cannula, we should advance them to a different product that can deliver more oxygen to those patients. Next is our simple mask. These are the masks that patients wear on their face, but there's usually no bag attached to them. So they're simple. It's just the plastic piece. There's some openings on the side, and those are our simple masks. These are designed for higher liter flow than a nasal cannula can provide. So six to 12 liters is where we really want to be using our simple masks to deliver that higher concentration of oxygen to our patients who are suffering from hypoxia and respiratory kind of issues. Above that is our non-rebreather. This is a very high level of respiratory intervention. We are giving the maximum amount of oxygen that can possibly be delivered to a patient externally. So a non-rebreather is a mask device. It looks like a simple mask, but it's got the bag on the bottom of it. So these are the kind like you see on the airplane demos that have the bag hanging down from the mask. That's what those look like. The bag may or may not inflate. I feel like a flight attendant now. But those are our non-rebreather masks. When we're using these, we are always using very high liter flow of oxygen. So always 10 to 15 liters of oxygen on one of these masks. One of the big dangers with both your simple and your non-rebreather mask is hypercarbia. So if we use these masks with less than these liter flows, there's not enough oxygen flowing into the device in order to clean out or blow out all the air that's been exhaled in that mask. So if we hold all that carbon dioxide right here in kind of where our nose and mouth, where we're breathing, 
then we can actually make patients hypercarbic if we don't have the appropriate high leader flow for those devices. So always, always, always make sure if you're using a mask, use it above six liters for a simple mask and really just maxed out for a non-rebreather. Beyond a non-rebreather, then we're looking at much, much more invasive levels of intervention leading up to intubation. Other common interventions around ways we can deliver medication specifically to the respiratory system, we've got our inhalers, which are like our meter dose inhalers or MDIs, the little puffers, or the discs that can actually puncture and aerosolize a medication that can be inhaled into the lungs. Some of the common types of drugs we're gonna talk about in a minute, but we give a lot of uh, bronchodilators, uh, mucus thinning uh, medications, and uh, steroids, which will reduce inflammation, are the most common types of medications we give via inhaler. And then our nebulizers, these are medications that are aerosolized in the device. So when patients are breathing in, it's like a mist that they're breathing in, like a very high humidity, almost like a aerosolized liquid, but it's like a fog that the medication is kind of infused into. So it's an aerosol deliver, delivery system. So some of the medications, the super, super common ones that you guys are going to see out in the community, I know this isn't a farm class, but just to give you guys kind of the lay of the land for the respiratory system, some common stuff we're gonna see. Things that address secretions. We wanna thin secretions. Oftentimes, you guys have probably experienced this yourself. If you get dehydrated, some of your mucus production can be really, really thick and it can be hard to cough it out. For patients with a compromised respiratory system, we do want to give medications such as guaifenesin or robitussin, which is going to reduce the viscosity. It's gonna thin those things out so they can more easily be expelled through coughing, deep breathing, and some of the natural respiratory hygiene practices that patients can do. So for assessment, one of the big things we wanna do is ask patients, have you been coughing? Do you have a productive cough? If so, what does the stuff coming up look like? Then anti-inflammatories. So a couple different flavors of anti-inflammatories that we can use for the respiratory system. We've got our atrovent and venolin, so albuterol, ipotropium. These are bronchiodilators, so they're gonna cause opening of the bronchioles so more air can pass through those, the lumens of those areas. And then our adver discus. So these are the kind of the purple discs that patients can breathe in. These things are all going to be, uh, and prednisone and prednisolone can be given oral or IV, but these are all our anti-inflammatory agents. They're not bronchiodilators, they're anti-inflammatories. So they're steroids, which are going to help to reduce inflammation in the airway. That's the primary action of those. And then for infection, we've got a lot of antibiotics and some antivirals that we can give for patients depending on the presentation. We're not gonna be prescribing these things, obviously, but if we start to see these medications around patients who have respiratory disease or a respiratory suspicious disease, then we can anticipate that that's what's going on with our patients. Um, yeah, so super common ones, just to kind of get the lay of the land. And next we're gonna be talking about our disease-specific problems around the respiratory system.